Jordan trying to shake off Starks. Oh, what a move! LeBron James with no regard for human life. Final seconds. Bryant for the win. Bang! Bang! Iverson against Gil, the crowd on its feet. Allen for the win. Sneaker History Podcast. What up, what up? Welcome to the Sneaker History Podcast. My name is Nick Ingvall. I got my guy, Robbie Falke, to talk about some kicks. We got to talk about a lot of new release stuff, a bunch of different brands, and kind of ask the question, what the hell's next in sneakers? Because right now, we're kind of in this dull moment of like, you know, good releases, but sparing, sparingly, sparingly, sparingly good releases. Sparingly. Uh, very few good releases. So what's good, man? How you doing? The goods are goods, and the bads are just not talked about. That's what's so funny. Like, bad footwear, quote-unquote, is just like footwear you want to see on sale and still ultimately buy. Um, but it's like <laughs> we're just fed a cycle of, like, it has to be so cool. It has to be, like, this, that, when really just, like, I like a lot of I like a lot of basic stuff. Like, I just bought another pair of Chuck 70s off of Kith because they were $57. It's like, ah, this weird baby blue Kith. And they weren't Kith, these weird baby blue chucks, like, for the price, it was right. They're not cool, right? They're not, like, a cool release, but, like, hey, not a bad come yeah, up. <laughs> I mean, I think that's, like, especially talking about brands outside of, like, you know, Nike, Jordan, and Yeezy, right? And, you know, Adidas, but, like, Yeezy specifically. That's the best thing about the Discord is, like, seeing everybody find all these random things. And, like, I love seeing, like, the the different, you know, like... I get texts from people and like t- sending me pictures of like Sockenies that they're looking for on, on sale. Cause it's like, they know the shoe either because they're into shoes or they've heard it on the podcast or seen it on our YouTube or whatever. And then now it's like, okay, cool. This one's pretty cool. I just don't want to pay like 90 bucks for it or 110 bucks for it. So when it goes on sale, I'm going to grab it. And then you see kind of that in real life in the discord and like the, what did you wear to age? What did you wear today? Channel where like, it's other than like theme days where we're like going through and picking a topic to go and find out of your collection. It's always such a mix of things. It's like, it's never consistent. That's what I love about it. Cause it's like you end up seeing stuff and you're like, damn, I would probably pay 40 bucks for that too. I'm going to go get those. Yeah. The, the, what did you wear today? Channel is If I have any time in the day, I pop in and I just go like like people's footwear because it's so cool. Just like it's like walking down the street and just everybody has cool footwear on, but it's in a scrolling format and just a lot of fun. So I think we'll come back to that because that might be an answer from one of us of where the direction of footwear is going. Um, But until then, footwear is still alive. There's a lot of cool stuff happening. Um, Actually, rap legend Raekwon right did a really awesome collaboration with Diodora and Foot Locker to where there was actually like a whole like hate to sound like an old head but like a whole like really old school feeling not just get together but like an actually like release party right it was actually like a community thing um happening in LA beautiful Diodora I think it's nine um and 9002s which I had a pair of myself in the past buttery materials if I, if there's anything about Diodora uh, they just are quality feeling shoes that N9002 is beautiful. But um, just to see like an actual install happen and it's not like, obviously people are there to like, to get the shoe and celebrate Ra- Raekwon. And there's been probably like what, three or four Raekwon Theodora yeah. collabs in the throughout the lifetime. But just to see people somewhere to like have fun, listen to music, hang out versus like, a sneaker con like, and nothing wrong with like cons cons are great, but just where it's it's such, there's so many things focused to like buy, buy, buy. And obviously foot locker wants you to buy the Diodora with Raekwon. That's why the party's happening, but just smaller events like that, more niche shoes like that tend to project more of a fun, uh, less competitive environment. Right. Cause there's enough shoes for everybody. Nobody's trying to like, you know, rush the front door, Yep. It's just like, hey, you like these shoes? You like Raekwon? Come to Foot Locker and buy these. They actually release on uh, Friday the 15th. Um, you can buy them at uh, the Foot Locker online, but especially you can get them in L.A. Um, they're also going to be available. Uh, what's the sister store with Foot Locker? I know this answer. Foot Action um, Champs? Foot Champs. Yeah, that's the second one. But uh, just like such a more fun, like kind of like more mom and pop feeling. 
And I love that. Me too, man. It's, it's the thing that I miss the most about living in LA or New York because I'm not necessarily attached to actually getting every pair of shoes the way I used to be mainly because of space constraints. <laughs> um, I mm-hmm. love getting shoes and like having them. And especially like, like you said, the Diodoras, you, unless you've had a pair of Diodoras in hand, you can't really, I can't really understand how good the quality of like their, I don't want to say basic, but like they are very much like standard, their standard offering is pretty good compared mm-hmm. to a lot of the other brands. And I just like being able to go chill and hang out and, you know, music vibes, connecting, networking and, and meet new people and talking to people. And like, I like absolutely miss that right now from, from all of it. But that, that's also kind of the, the, the best part about, you know, the, the I don't want to keep, I'm not trying to like plug the discord so hard, but if you're in the discord, you know, it's just like, you know, it's, it's a great way to connect with people. I mean, Hell, Robbie's been traveling around the country, meeting people in the Discord and going to baseball games and going to eat and all that stuff. And like, it, the Discord is like the closest to that that I can get without being in one of those places. I guess is the best way to put mm-hmm. it. But to kind of piggyback off the Diodora thing, like their baseline's fantastic. There's a whole heritage line, which is like the premium stuff, and like very few times do you get like a premium offering, and it actually feels doubly double premium. But even just like think about what Adidas typically does or Nike uh, or Reeb, you know, the bigger brands that pretty much isn't Diodora, right? They're they're aiming for experiences, like, you know, on to like they put on a great experience, right? You're, yep. you're there to kind of be immersed and there's like money behind it and it's great. And there's money behind the Diodora Foot Locker stuff, but it's ultimately still like an OG platform stage with like Foot Locker branding on the bottom. And it's like that's kind of all you need sometimes, right? It's a community of people, some music, the product. And it's like, people can really vibe with stuff like that. And I love huge events. Like those are so much fun. I've had great time at big sneaker events. Like, and the thing I didn't like the yeah. thing about that too, like, is that like, I didn't mention it, but like the thing that I really, really miss is like, when you get that shoe, it's forever important to you because it was about all those people in that community that you were a part of the conversations you had, And you remember it and it's so closely tied that it becomes more important. You know, like we talk about it all the time, right? We get stuff and it's like, eh, whatever, this is cool, but I don't need three of this or five of this. So like, I'm going to get rid of a couple of these colorways, but that also is why I like those events and why I like being a part of communities and connecting with people because that that's a reason to keep the shoe, right? Like, I mean, Mm -hmm. I'm redoing the room, but you guys have seen the wall behind me. If you've watched previous episodes and like, you know, the first half of that, that wall is all about shoes I've been a part of or connected to, or people that I appreciate that, that made something cool that I wanted to support just because I have a personal connection to, to the people behind the shoe. And that's, that's where I want to go with my collection. Even it's like, I just want to keep going to like more and more important things that I can take that story and retell it 10, 20 years from now. When somebody asks me what what that weird shoe is that they've never seen before, because ultimately that's what happens, right? We get into this, we get into these phases where, like, you know, twenty fifteen to twenty eighteen, everyone on the planet was wearing Yeezys and Ultra Boosts. Twenty nineteen or you know twenty seventeen to twenty twenty one, everyone on the planet is wearing Dunks and Off White stuff. You know, like it's it's like it overshadows all of the other shoes, but there's so many good things happening in these other places that that's where like the good, like the really cool stuff bubbles up in my opinion. So here's an update on America from me as a correspondent. Now being on like the both coasts <laughs> and the Midwest ultra boosts are not cool, but ultra boosts and honestly on like on an ultra boost, I've seen more on more feet of more differently aged, gendered background people so like the ultra boost, yeah, they're, they're no longer cool, but that just means they've now been like assimilated into this like normal footwear life. Like, um, Noah got a pair for his mom when he was out here visiting me in Portland. Cause like mom's like ultra boost, but like, I was so shook by this, like this family's like, Oh, two pairs of ons, the ultra boost. And like the son has like a pair of, of Jordans on, you know, like somebody in the group has like a, you know, a quote unquote cooler sneaker. I've done this like eight times in this recording already, but just like. Not everything has to be so cool. Like 
I purposely wore a pair of Ultra Boost in Chicago because I was like, my my dogs are going to be barking, and guess what? They did not bark in the Ultra Boost. So there's nothing wrong with that. Like you know, there's cool stuff. There's practical stuff. There's important collecting things. I'm gonna kind of use that as a pivot um, to our next topic on uh, Hebrew Brantley. And personally, I don't collect enough things. I know you're probably very familiar with his statues, um, Frog Boy, and um, I got one. Yeah, right. I you probably have one that's super close yeah. to you. Yeah, Frog Boy and Rocket. Like I've seen those things so many places. I'm a big fan of Bait, so I, I've done a couple of collabs with Bait. I'm like, oh, I've I've seen that. I've seen it. I've seen it. But uh, Jita's did a collaboration with him on a forum high and low. Uh, personally, we'll go over which one we like more. But they actually released yesterday on the confirmed app, uh, July 14th. Um, I actually didn't try on the confirmed app. I should have. Dang it. I missed it. But um, this is just another level of just like bringing creatives in where it's like he's much different, right? But this is like having a stash collab or like, and artist collabs can, can hit so much different, right? Like a Keith Haring, um, whoever did the earth day stuff. I think maybe that was also Keith Haring, uh, the Nike earth day art, but just artists and sneakers artists like peanut butter and jelly. Sometimes it's like, a, it's a, it's a literal canvas. I'm gonna quit talking. Cause I, you know, way more about him than I do, but I just like saw these and I was like, damn, those are two really good looking shoes. I like the, the low top more. What are, you, what are you feeling? Yeah, I mean, I I really like the low top. Um, I I didn't hit on it. I did actually try on the confirmed app, but uh, I think the interesting thing about about artist collabs when there's someone like Hebrew Brantley, you know, his artwork is way over. I don't want to say overpriced is not the right term. It's way out of most people's price range, right? Mm -hmm. That's where you know, like I actually tried to get one of his probably first four or five prints uh, way back in the day. And, and I just, I really couldn't justify spending the money for something that I, I couldn't, I could, I didn't even have space for it on the walls where I was living at the time. Yeah. And I think that's the really interesting thing about whether it's like the toys, like you're talking about, or, you know, the vinyl collectibles that, that bait does, which are, are great. Um, shout out to my, Buddies at DesignerCon, that's coming up in a, in a few months. They just announced the dates for it later this year in Anaheim. And, that, like, I don't know if Hebrew will be there, but he, he has in the past. I'm sure there's opportunity for him to be there. But it's also, like, a cool cool thing for people that are, like, new on the art scene to get into and, and do these collaborations because it's, like, an entry-level point to get to know them and to become a fan of them, you know, uh, for people that actually create physical things, that's a huge, huge struggle, right? Like for us, we're doing the podcast and, you know, we're creating content and throwing it out on social and stuff. But like the podcast is, is like our kind of gateway to the discord and becoming a part of the Patreon and all that stuff for artists when they're trying to sell, you know, let's say a print of something or, or, you know, some sort of sculpture or something like that you're talking about potentially thousands of dollars to, to sell that stuff and it, cause it's expensive to make. So when mm -hmm. they get to partner with a brand like Adidas, that, that cost kind of goes away for the artist because the brand takes on a lot of the cost and the artist does like the creative stuff and, you know, they work together on it and probably figure out a way to split the profits and stuff. But more importantly, Adidas can make, I don't even know how many pairs are made of these, of these forms, but, Let's say they made 10,000. Let's say they made 5,000 of them, right? Yeah. 5,000 people getting to wear or see or or see Hebrew Brantley's art every day is way more than, you know, the 300 pieces that he might sell of in prints for another thing or the couple hundred p pieces that Bait does in a in a vinyl collectible. And mm -hmm. even less of the people that get to actually go into the, to the, you know, galleries and see his work if you're in the right place at the right time to do that. So the, the collaboration and, and he's, he's well-established, right? Like he's yeah already had a Jordan collab already had, you know, multiple crazy opportunities, you know, throughout the he's prime sneakers time. and streetwear. Yeah. But for the new people that these types of collabs are like, 
can potentially be rocket ships to to do other things, right? Not to be punny with yeah. you know his artwork, but it's kind of how it works, right? A kid could hop on that partnership, and you know five thousand people now know his name because they got his shoes. Fifty thousand people might know his name because Adidas promoted the collab, and now that kid goes from like making artwork in a you know a small town or a suburb of you know Chicago and next thing you know he's the next Hebrew Brantley and we're talking about him in a few years doing a whole collab or a whole collection you know kind of like the Candace Parker stuff we got to talk about that's that's a really positive spin on it this the, the idea of you you get to enjoy somebody's artwork and artist Hebrews in this case his artwork which is very expensive on your feet every day and like look at it Cause like one of my personal, like biggest, like dope moments is a uh, Jew working on projects. Who has also had a Nike collab, New York times. He's a, he's a great artist. Fantastic. Um, I asked if like, you know, to get something worked on one time and he said the price and I could not afford, like he said, I, I probably uh, early on, like I could probably have afforded if I would have like not eaten for a little bit. Um, now yesterday's price is not today's price. So like Hebrew yep. Brantley, like getting a Hebrew Brantley print or a Hebrew Brantley anything original from him is not going to be the same as the 180 bucks as that forum or you know 150 whatever the, the forum price is. And now you get to enjoy it. Like I never thought about the getting to enjoy it part. So that's... Well, and especially if you think about like like you mentioned Keith Herring, right? I mean, oh, yeah, a real right. Keith Herring piece is hundreds of thousands of dollars at very minimum. Yeah. He was in the museum. Most people are never going to be able to afford that. Most people would never spend that kind of money, but like, you know, to be able to turn that into a, a, you know, a bear brick or, a a, you know, a shoe or, you know, like you get to be connected to that artist in a way that just is not even possible with their actual artwork. And I know some people don't like that. Like, it's kind of interesting because some artists are like, no, I'm not going to do any of that. And others, you know, like I'm a cause fan and collect cause stuff. And, you know, at this point, he's gone too far down that path for me because, you know, the first time around it was cool and it, and it disappeared. You had to know what it was back in the early 2000s and late 90s. What do you mean? Uh, the the exclusive, the, how exclusive this stuff is, is cool? Like, well, so, so, isn't cool? so he, he came up as a graffiti artist. And, you know, kind of just like came, became mainstream, uh, like kind of, I would say not mainstream. That's not the right way. He came up he and is, became though. popular kind of in subculture of things in the nineties and two thousands. Right. So you mm-hmm. kind of had to be paying attention to him. And then next thing you know, like he got to do a, uh, you know, a Macy's day parade float and, and kind of disappeared for a while, but he wasn't really making a lot of like collectibles at that time. Then. I think in the last, let's say five to 10 years or so, he has really gone hard into it. So like he's dropping tons of these, these vinyl collectible toys. He's dropping, you know, tons of artwork. I mean, posters and prints and, you know, doing a bunch of different gallery shows. And I think it's, it's a beautiful thing. It's just that for me personally, there was it's kind of like in sneakers, right? Like there's always those moments where you're like, yeah, I love all these people here that are into sneakers, but damn, I I remember just being able to line up with 10 or 15 people to grab a pair of shoes that I wanted. And it kind of has that same effect in the art world when somebody goes, you know, as popular as he has. And, you know, I'm not mad at that. I'm, I'm stoked for him personally because look, he's living good kids are going to go to college. Grandkids are going to go to college. Like those are the kind of things that like change people's lives in a way that we can't even fathom without being really close to a person that goes through that success. And, you know, it's just more on the, like the, you know, you get, you get to that point where like things, now there's so many counterfeits of his things that you can, I'm sure if you looked on eBay, there's probably, you know, more than half of them are all fake. Right. And just, they've kind of made it like, less enjoyable for the people that were really passionate about it the first time around. And I think it's very similar to sneakers. I mean, just it's the same thing, right? Like we're going through all this, you know, all these counterfeit fake issues and conversations that are going on with Nike and StockX and all these platforms and stuff now, just part of the game, I guess. 
shit, that's like similar with like any kind of artist. I'm just thinking like, um, who is really excited when fucking like Rob Rod Stewart releases new music? Like nobody, <laughs> right? Right? But it's just like, oh, he made it great. Like you used to be like a small struggling guy, and now like you got really big. Now you're just like, Claus is Claus is still definitely in like the upper part of his career. <laughs> Rod Stewart's at you know at the tail end, but you know it's just like yeah. Maybe maybe slow down a bit on the releases there, buddy. Um, to any kind of artist, that's just him. But ultimately, it comes down to oh no, he has financial stability as an artist, which is super fucking hard to do. Like, congrats, like big Manny. It's, that's sarcasm to our listeners. You can't see my face. That's like a <laughs> huge congrats. Like to make that much money legitimately off your art. Like that's that's ask any ask any of your friends around you who do art, and that's. Yeah, easier and, hard and, to do exactly yeah and i say all that like i'm i mean you if you're listening to this podcast and you probably know that i'm doing three other podcasts during the week so like you know i'm one of those people that is like do it while you can make your mark leave your mark on society leave something tangible for people to remember you by so i say all that from a very like you know i got my collectible you know nerdy graffiti fan glasses on when I say that, because mm -hmm. like I, I'm a hundred percent, I think everybody should be out there. Like just, I don't think you, sh I don't think you should just do it uncontrollably, but when it's calculated and thought out and the stories are told and the, you know, the, the hype is built in the right way. It's a great experience for both the person that's doing the art, creating the collaborations and selling the stuff and the fans that want to be a part of it. You know, just like we were talking about Hebrew Brantley, or or the event with Raekwon even like, you know, that same process and the same things that can make something unattainable because so many people are interested are the things that actually make it great too. And if you're, if you have the opportunity to do it, you should do it. Like, like who cares if you don't sell out in five seconds, like people expect on the internet, fuck that shit, do as much as you can and do as much cool shit as you can. So you can look back and be like, yo, I did that shit. Because if you miss and it doesn't work, nobody's going to care. Nobody's going to be like, ha, 20 years ago, after you had 20 years of success, that one time I was there and you didn't succeed that time. I mean, there might be people that do that, but that's also the people that are buried in their basement, you know, tweeting on 4chan right now. Yeah, you're not a very normal person at that point. <laughs> yeah. um, to switch it up to something a little more light and happy, kind of a reach here. But do you remember in Wayne's World when Garth and Wayne are talking about corporate sponsorship um, and they're like, oh, I don't want to be I don't want to be held down by the man. And it's like eating Doritos and eating various things. Yeah. And it comes to Garth and Garth's wearing like a full Reebok head to toe Reebok outfit. I bring yep. up that story to get a to get a color scheme visual because it's Dana Carvey in all white, red and blue, like the classic Reebok colors and Reebok has an Omnizone pump two coming out. That's pays homage homage to that vector red vector blue and white, the classic Reebok colors, right? The British flag looking, you know, you've seen a, you've seen a box before. Um, and I just cannot get the visual of Dana Carvey out of my head. It's like, I kind of want to go buy a full Reebok, like nylon kind of puffer suit. And just like, lay back with my headband on and I mean, chill, that'd be an like, amazing Halloween costume. It would be an amazing, especially with these shoes. I don't think these were, he's probably wearing like a workout or something, um, in, in that movie, but just, I'm just thinking we've discussed this in the past. And it's like, if like the, if like your 10 most popular shoes are still cool and they come back in like ebbs and flows, like right now, like kind of bigger, chunkier shoes kind of haven't gone away right i mean designer has definitely gone more sleek but for the most part like bigger clunkier shoes or ankle protection as we love to say in the discord is alive and well with footwear so it's like if you drop the omni zone two at the right time it's not out all the time right there's definitely years where it's like saved specifically for collabs or you know with the boutique or something but over the past like three years we've had like all of the OG colorways, I think both of the OG colorways, you know, homage colorways. But I think we're right in that like happy area where it's 
not too much, not too that that Goldilocks level of Omnizone two releases. And just personally, even thinking about to how Reebok ads used to be, and they all kind of had like white, red, and blue like feel to it. So I'm ultimately getting to the point that like storytelling doesn't have to be crazy. It doesn't have to be all up in your face. Sometimes a white, red, and blue around July kind of means 4th of July. Sometimes it kind of means your shoe heritage. And in this case, it's coincidentally means Wayne's World and just that white, red, and blue. <laughs> and, but like with Allen Iverson and all the shoes, right? It's all the shoes Reebok ever released, right? Like I feel like most people don't really think of white, red, and blue with them anymore. Like you think of orange with Nike or you think of just like black and white with Adidas. Uh, but yeah, hella cool to see that come back. And it really made me think like, Oh, all the old ads that nobody ever likes when I post on sneaker history, all those like things. It's like all the cool old vintage Reebok stuff was really just like wholesome and white, red and blue. Yeah. Yeah. Totally agree. And it's also like kind of low key team USA colors when there's, USA basketball going on. I feel right. like I, I I think too like it's kind of so in a recent episode that should be up before this episode I think uh, Rowett and Mike it might be a Patreon exclusive. R- Rowett and Mike talk about Wimbledon right and like some of the colors that pop up there and like that's like a, a very like Wimbledon kind of vibe too right it's yeah super clean couple of accent colors it's also just like a formula that works right. You don't have to get too crazy with it sometimes. It's fun sometimes to go, you know, like Nerf collab, wild colors, loud everything. <laughs> no, I forgot but then dropped, yeah. at, the, at the same time, it's like, you know, keeping it simple and kind of doing something classic. And I think that colorway is like, I want to say like the court victory pump, uh, Michael Chang shoe was originally that color too. They did like a... Um, I have a pair of the uh, the Reebok Insta Pumps that's inspired by that shoe, too. Mm-hmm. It's just like kind of classic, like you said, classic Reebok, wholesome, simple, gets the job done. Usually, that colorway looks pretty good. If I'm being honest. So, so I mean, the colors are literally called Vector Red, Vector Blue, and Classic Chalk. Vector being the logo of Reebok. What I'm getting to is I feel like, and especially in modern times in 2022 with forever changing social climates, white, navy, and red is kind of like America. But like white, royal, and red is kind of like fun, hip, I like America. It's kind of cool sometimes. It also like sucks a lot. But like the fun aspect, I don't know why the navy and like the royal switch up makes such a difference, but it gives like even a more retro vibe. I don't know because this like cameras back there and just couldn't get the saturations right. But like I get more of a hit flavor from this Omnizone pump versus like a straight up. Uh, oh, like I I have a pair of them still. Like the the white, red, and blue, um, the unreleased questions that Alan Iverson didn't wear in like the two thousand um, Olympics. Um, yeah, yeah. Like those, like that Navy is like an aggressive America Navy, but like the white Royal blue and red is more just like, let's have some fun in some Omni zones. I don't know why it feels that way, but it does. Now let's go back into the dark conversation. If you talk about this. Game. Yeah, seriously. Um, yeah. Right. I mean, so it's a, it's a difficult subject amongst Gosh, it's like a laundry list of difficult subjects um, in existence right now. But like positive spin, Adidas has had a fantastic all-star weekend with the WNBA promoting Candace Parker and her new uh, second leg of a collection. There was the Exhibit A that dropped earlier in the year with the shoe. Part two is dropping soon. Uh, th- there's her nickname being Ace. Candace is such a great, I mean, role model as like, you know mom, female athlete, this levels of super coolness to Candace Parker. And you don't even really start to think about how like dominant she's been in her sport. I remember she played for Pat Summit in Tennessee. I remember her dunking in the all American game, like watching the all American game back when people would like watch ESPN two during the middle of the day in the summertime because you didn't have a car and 
there was no social media, so he's like, watch TV. Uh, I watched every McDonald's All-American game up until there was social media. And she stuck out then. Um, so they had a great event for her. She's, you know, the event was in Chicago. She's from Chicago, drafted by the LA Sparks, played like, you know, 18 something years there from like 08 to 2000. And now she's finishing her career with the Chicago Sky. So like the Chicago Ace coming back home, hometown team, all star weekend for the WNBA there. All this great, happy fanfare. Love seeing it. The shoes look great. That's all fantastic. But like most things, even like with our social media feed, right? Even you're scrolling down, you're like, oh, that's funny. That's a cute cat video. Those are some boobs. Those are cool. You know, you're, you're just scrolling. Then it's like, oh, bad news, bad news, bad news. And like you start like realizing like for every like happy party there is, there's just like somebody missing or there's like a somber undertone. And like the big missing piece obviously is, you know, Phoenix Mercury star Brittany Grinder. Um, now what four months or something like that still being detained in russia uh an adidas athlete perennial wmba all-star um you know an, an american i mean i think you're i mean if you're an olympian you're a patriot right people just think you know patriot you yeah. think of one stupid thing but like you she served her country like more than one way like she's awesome um but she's not an all-star weekend she's not with her family in phoenix she's not like doing anything she wants to be doing right now. And it's like tough to come to grip sometimes where it's just like, all oh, this, like all this fun, great things happening. And like, we all have, I've had, everybody has things in their life where it's just like, that's really bad for you, but like the world still has to move on. But it really sucks when like you see it and like, it's the juxtaposition between like happy party than like Brittany Grinder, you know, in a Crenshaw t-shirt in, cuffs in yeah. russia and it's like fuck that's real life too and it's just like it's it's incredible what we can do and what also can't be done sometimes and i'm just i'm worth i'm thinking of britney i think we're all thinking of britney you should be thinking of britney but just like the juxtaposition of like two adidas athletes in the same sport and it's just like one and i know adidas can't like get britney grinder out of russia that's not what i'm saying but just like that's a big thing happening over here while happy events happening over here and just like the gap between this makes it feel like a, you know, a chasm sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and it's such a, it's such a polarizing situation too, because obviously of the, the war in Ukraine and Russia, you know, it's like, like you said, you can look at it, you can see Brittany Griner in a, Crenshaw shirt and handcuffs and it's like what the fuck right like like I get angry about it and over a little bit of weed oil in 2022 right yeah that that's a whole that's a whole other conversation yeah just the fact Crazy. that it's happening is is like so fucked up mm -hmm. and yet if you look at it from like a, a Hey, these countries going to war perspective. It's like, well, fuck. Like, I mean, I just don't even know how these things politically are handled or worked out or any of it. It feels like to me that there's not being enough done and mm -hmm. it's frustrating as a fan to not see her in her element. Like she should be, we, we should be talking about her right now. And, and, you know, she's, she's, wearing and collection and dunking in the all-star game, you know, like that should be the experience that, that she deserves because she's worked her ass off to get to that point. And yet at the same time, you know, like I just feel, I feel sorry for, for her friends and family that, you know, just the, I can't fathom what it's like to not know what's going on with your loved one. And, you know, Basketball is important. Her stardom and her fans are hugely important. But, like, throw all that out the window when you really don't even know if your loved one is safe because yeah. they're halfway around the planet, you know, stuck in a jail cell. Safety so. and livelihood mean more than anything else. And it's, like, a bummer. We're not, we're not, we're not going to stay on this too long. But it's just, like, we have her really being used, right? I think she's just, like, a pawn yep. at this point. And that's not fair. Obviously, it's not fair to her. She's 
and probably when I close my eyes and think of like top ten places I wouldn't want to be, like yeah. an Eastern European, you know, Russian jail is like kind of not that's on the list of places I don't want to be. She's like living that nightmare. So that her yeah. family, yeah, just that has to say that has to be so hard is like the understatement of the century. So here's this I one think- time to break up some timeline and to say you know think about her what can we and yeah. this was even so powerful it's like what can we do it's like ah and it's like other than just be upset and like yeah it's, it's so crazy because we feel helpless as casual fans i can't fathom what it's like to be anywhere near or a part of her life mm-hmm. and and like you've got to feel exponentially helpless and Hopefully, you know, I just send positive vibes. Uh, that's all I can say about it. It's just such a, it's such a shitty situation. And, you know, kind of circling back to like the Candace Parker conversation, it's interesting you brought up like the, um, the McDonald's all American stuff, because that was like, that was like the height of WNBA basketball for me because the Monarchs were, they didn't, I think Candace Parker's 2000, she got drafted Four in early. five. No, no it's earlier than that, that, right? No, because um, no, yeah, because she well, she did four years at Tennessee. So she did McDonald's All American game. She went to Tennessee in two thousand four to two thousand eight. Played for okay, Pat so Summit, yeah, t- so then... two thousand four. So the Monarchs won two thousand five, two thousand six. So like I was I was spending all day watching those games on ESPN too. It's crazy to think how far my life has come where. I barely get to watch NBA games or WNBA games. But back then, like I was probably watching that McDonald's all American game live. Cause that's the same era of like LeBron. Right. And mm-hmm. I'll watch that one. Carmelo, like, you know, J.R. Just, Smith. Yeah. J.R. Smith. Yep. It's just crazy because you don't even, I don't know, man, never grow up. If you're listening to this, yeah, right. it's already too late. Time flies. <laughs> um, I mean, and the times do change. Things, tastes. You were, we were talking about earlier in this episode how Ultra Boost had a wave, and it's just we alluded to in the top of the episode of like what what's next in sneakers. And I wore this hat on purpose, thinking about that conversation because a good friend of ours, we've had him on the show. Uh, you know, Dan Gamach, beautiful Mach custom shoes. Um, is actually having a Chicago White Sox release coming up, official with the team. Like, yeah. not like a, awesome. an homage to the socks. Like, no, the logo's on the shoe. It says South Side on the corner, beautiful pinstriping. I don't know if official photos have come out yet, but we were talking, and he DM'd me the photo of them. Um, and just like that, I think, is the direction of footwear, not just his shoes, not just shoe by, you know, you know independent brands. But ultimately, I think just sneakers as an umbrella. And and I, I go further with this because like you said, I've been I've been traveling a lot. So like I was I've been seeing shoes in New York, Chicago, and Portland. I have I, I like to just look in like Nordstrom's or Saks Fifth Avenue and see what sneakers they're selling and what's on what's out for sale, what's you know, what's in concepts, so and so. Um and my big takeaway is like every sneaker brand traditional Nike, Adidas, Reebok, uh, all like the heavy, big name, uh, big box brand players for, for the most part. Those are the stuff that's sitting. But what I see the most mystique about, what I see the most um, like day-to-day people trying on in those stores, when I'm just like sitting in sacks, like waiting for my feet to cool off because I'm hot and it's, like watching people try on shoes. It's the the other sneakers. It's not just on, but like Dan's, Mosh custom, custom stuff is like a good looking trainer that's comfortable and has cool colorways. Not everybody is on the Nike Cool It anymore. There's some disillusioned people now. Somebody at this point in time is disillusioned by some brand, but everybody still has to wear shoes. I personally do not like wearing boots. I'll never pair, put a pair of Doc Martens on. They're not comfortable to me. I'm never going to wear fucking cowboy boots. I'm never going to wear like Chelsea loafers for fun. My option is sneakers, right? So if I don't like a brand, I still need to find a sneaker. And I think that's where Mach Customs really fits in, especially as he gets more collabs with like 
Socks are fucking huge. That's an MLB team. That's like a big business. It's a yeah. huge collab. But, you know, the Louis Vuitton trainers, um, they're super expensive, right? They're like, uh, I looked at them. I held them. I was very impressed with the LV. Like, it's called the LV trainer. Uh, it was like 1300 bucks, 1100 bucks. Um, but I see that shoe in different colorways in downtowns now in three different cities more than I see like Jordan ones almost like somebody who has had every air Jordan one might be looking for something else. And like an LV trainer is like right in that alley. It's a sneaker. It's comfortable. It's familiar. It's designer. That's great. But really you could spend like 1500 bucks on a resale shoe X or go to Saks and buy retail shoe X and know it's like you can return it because it's from a store store. You know, there's like the backing of a real, I'm not saying Louis V shoes are worth 1500, 1200 bucks, but like that is a Louis Vuitton shoe. Like you could resell that still for cat coming meowing. Um, you could sell that thing, not for what you paid for it, but you know, 800 bucks, 900 that you're going to get a good amount of money back. Like yeah. it's a quality item. And I feel like I personally don't go to outlets anymore. Any outlet, like I don't need a discounted Nike. I don't need a discounted Adidas. I don't want those. If I like want to buy something it has to be unique, it has to be different. I'm still not so, I still like all those big normal brands. So I wear kind of everything, but it means less. The big collab means less and less to me as something that looks a little unique is a sneaker and feels good on my feet. But just like so many people are either like, I only wear Adidas. Especially in Portland, I see this. I only wear Adidas. I only wear Nike. I only wear Nike and I hate everybody else, like the brands. Or you wear Shoe X. And I think the, the, the population of Shoe X, be it on Diodora, uh, ASIC, Louis Vuitton, Mosh Customs, whatever it might be, that segment's getting bigger and bigger as people get less and less shoes off sneakers or as people take more and more L's. Like, whatever makes you dislike whatever you're wearing now, I think those practices aren't going away. And this that fourth option is just going to keep getting bigger. And I love it. I think this openness is my answer. Yeah, I, I agree, man. I think, uh, you know, it kind of reminds me of like we talked about the Jordan 5s a few episodes back, right? And talking about 2006, 2007, when they dropped all those crazy new colorways, and it was all exciting because it was the first time we were seeing colorways that we didn't see on Jordans before. Mm -hmm. And both of us were kind of like, yeah, these are all great, but hindsight, like, we only really want, like, one or two of those at most. But, like, Unless back in mean, the day, yeah. we would have both bought probably every one of them and been like, I need to have all of them, right? Because mm -hmm. we didn't know that they were going to keep coming. At this point, you know that everything is going to continue to move forward for the most part. You're not going to see retros of, you know, Mosh's socks collab. You know, maybe, maybe who knows, 10, 20 years down the road. I don't know. That'd Hope be he cool. fucking does. <laughs> yeah. If he's doing, if he's doing that, he's, he's doing something right. Right. But it's like, to me, I think that, I think that we've got, we've like the kind of swing of sneakers has gone from people like, that have been into it being real intentional about like, ah, eh, I don't need all those. I'm only going to grab, you know, the couple colorways that I want of a retro and I'm going to go diversify a little bit, like you're saying, but then it's also like, it's, it's swung so far into like mainstream that we have, you know, like, I don't dislike the, you know, black and white Panda dunks, but I see them all the time. So like, I would never wear that shoe. I mean, I don't even wear, like Jordan retros at this point, hardly at all, because I see so many of them. And that's just because they've, they were, have been super trendy for the last couple of years. And I just don't really, you know, it's rare that I get, gets excited about a new release that I want to wear all the time, right out of the box. That's like something that I see elsewhere, right? If it's, you know, a little bit off, a little bit more nuanced where people would have to really know the collaborator or the sneaker kind of game in order for people to like actually appreciate what I'm wearing, that's kind of what I'm wearing. So that could be anything from like a, you know, I've gassed up the neighborhood ZX 8,000 for like three years now or two years now, 
But like, I love that shoe. I bought four pair of them. I would probably, I'll probably buy a couple more because I keep seeing them pop up places for pretty cheap. And I like the first couple pairs are completely beat. I wear them every day. Kind of like to your point about like just needing a trainer that's comfortable. And like, if, especially if I'm not going and socializing as much as I used to, I don't wear like the crazy stuff just to wear it. Like I'll pull it out for like, you know, sharing it in the discord or community calls and talking about it. But like, I'm just not wearing that stuff as frequently as I used to. And for me, that just becomes like a way to like, you know, kind of be more focused and more intentional about what I'm buying as opposed to just buying a bunch of stuff. Cause you know, if you gave me a list of a hundred shoes that were like $50 and under in my mind, I could justify buying at least 95 of them. Yeah. Right. I don't need 95 pairs of shoes right now, but like, that's how my mind works with sneakers where it's like, man, this is a GR, but it's a great colorway. This is uh, you know, like such and such collab. And then like on top of that, I go, Oh, this is a part of a set. So there's three of them. So then I buy one and that means I got to go get the other three or the other two. Yeah. And like, I'm trying to like reel that back in a little bit, not to say that I'm trying to unload my entire collection or anything, but like, I'm just trying to be more intentional about what I'm buying, having those emotional and personal connections to the stuff. And I, I think we're actually going to see like general consumers doing that more. Right. I think we're kind of seeing the dunk kind of fade a little, we're kind of seeing Jordan's fade a little. And I think that, I think that forces the brands to be more, to be more intentional about the way they market shoes too. Right. Look, Nike hasn't had to do anything to sell dunks for the last 18 months, but like once that energy goes away, they got to figure out how to like, okay, do we pull this back in, stop making dunks for a while? Do we only do SB collabs Do you know, like there's a lot of variables when you're working in the brand and that's part of the fun and working in the footwear industry for me, at least working with any on any project, because there's so many things that can make something cool to a very specific group of people, but you have to make sure you get to those people. And I think we're going to start seeing more of these like really nuanced things. Kind of like you said with Mosh and the white Sox, right? It's, it's cool for, for like sneaker heads that know Dan and like, you know, are fans of what he does. Cause the shoes are super dope. But like when you put that in front of white Sox fans, you know, let's say you've got 35, 40,000 people in the stands. Not everybody's going to be willing to spend the money for that shoe to be a white as a white Sox fan. Cause it might not, they might not care about sneakers, but there will probably be a few thousand that are like super excited about it. Very. It's like, Oh, there's a connection and there's a story here and there's a memory here. If I can get this, I'm going to have that memory to carry on and wear with me and talk about with my friends when I'm out drinking after the win, you know? So I hope we're headed in that direction. Kind of like a, Kind of like what you said and, and where I'm saying, like, it's just more specific and intentional about what you're buying because it, it right now, it just seems like there's just so much of everything. Like you, if we tried to do actual release episodes and talk about every single thing that came out, we would do like three hour episodes every three days, you know, it'd just be impossible. It'd be, yeah. It wouldn't be fun. Exactly. I'm trying exactly. to think, man, try to be more intentional in my last pickups. It's hard to turn the water off. I fought like four <laughs> pairs of shoes in the past like seven weeks. And it's like, fuck, I don't even like, but they're all, yeah, you know, right? Just because, justified due to price, justified due to price. My friend released it, so I had to. And then too good of a price to pass up. It's like three of those are just stupid justification. One of them is like friendship. <laughs> the, it's, the, it's Keith's shoe, the Trailblazing Reebok. I bought it. Because I love him, and like the shoe looks good. The other three are just like, well, if I got to blow money, might as well blow it low. I don't know. Anywho, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh man, Keith, we gotta get Keith on here. We hundred percent will. There's a couple yeah. people um, on the docket. Been busy. Yeah. That people have been busy. Things are coming. Trying to refocus. Some, more. Summertime's a, a, hard, a hard time. Hard time to lock people down to do a podcast. Compared, man, it's so. tough. It is tough. Yeah. But Nick, where can they find you? If someone wanted to find you to lock you down, where, where are you? Hey, available? at Nick Engvall on all the platforms, uh, or in the Discord, also at Nick Engvall. Beautiful. You can find me at R A H B E E seven zero two. And just thank you guys for listening. If you didn't hear the first nine times. 
there's a Discord, you're more than welcome to come join. Please leave a review if you're listening to this on a podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe as a YouTube addict. It really helps the algorithm. Not lying. So thank you for being here with us. Have a good day. Peace.